Check, check, check. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okie dokie, gonna get started. Whew. Oh, wrong one. <laughs> Hello friends, happy Wednesday. <laughs> I'm Jen Vega. this stream is a deep dive into ingredients, cooking techniques, and recipes to help you cook for yourself during quarantine and well, the rest of your life. This is called Attack the Pantry. Uh, last time we talked about charcuterie for like over an hour. <laughs> I was very surprised with myself, but very proud at the same time. Uh, we also talked about tomatoes, which was also very exciting because they are in season right now. Uh, you can watch all the clips here on my channel if you click on videos. Uh, Twitch deletes these streams, so I upload all the archive to youtube.com slash J-E-N-N-D-L-V, and you can subscribe there. For more than just the streams, I've got skate videos and tutorials and every other video appearance that I have is archived there, um, so you can check that out. Um, this past Sunday, I had another stream where we look at zines. Uh, we checked out Put an Egg on It issue 14, a zine made by a fourth grader called BTS Aren't That Bad, and an issue of Culture Magazine, which is a cheese publication. How are we doing over here in the chat? Hi, Lucius. Good to see ya. What is up, everyone? Hooray. Um, so there's a lot of talk on Twitter right now about uh, Twitch streaming, which is what you are watching right now. Uh, and I was really lucky to make uh, Twitch affiliate three months ago. I can't believe it's been three months. So thank you to those of you who are subscribed already to this channel. I looked at the um, monetary stuff and it's about like $17 per month, which is way better than Spotify um, 
royalties and way better than Amazon Associates like affiliate linking. Um, I, I, I feel like this was much easier to achieve by regularly like just doing what you do by streaming than, um, than YouTube affiliate, uh, which is you have to have like 400 hours watched. Like people have to watch your channel for like 400 hours. And the bar is much lower here on Twitch and gets us quicker to revenue, uh, which is really cool because a lot of artists and creative people are struggling right now, including me. Um, but if you are not a subscriber yet, you can click on the purple button that says gift a sub. You can connect your Amazon Prime account to give a little bit of money to your favorite creators every month. Um, for those of you who are subscribed, they renew every month, just so you know. And it's totally okay if you need to drop off because money is hard to come by these days for some of us. Um, so you can support a number of different ways by like sharing my social, telling people to join us when the stream starts. Like those kinds of things are also very helpful uh, to growing the audience. So hello, everyone. Um, let's see, what's been happening? Um, on Monday, I released a new kind of skate video where I actually talk. Like, all the skate videos I've, I've published so far, I haven't said a word except for, you know, when I, when I fall or go, ah, dang, you know, <laughs> those kinds of things. Uh, but I had to explain sort of the shift because, uh, I'm skating more often but not able to put the camera down. Like, I don't have a second skater like most skate videos do. So, um, it's just going to be kind of clips and compilations more so than single sessions, unless I do like an hour outside by myself in the same spot, like, then yeah, it'll be its own video. But lots of skate videos, there are now 19 of them, which is crazy. Um, let's see, we might, I wasn't sure about the scheduling, but we might have our first episode of Float City on Friday. Float City is our mini series from Fun City, which is a Shadowrun podcast that I'm on. Float City, we're going to be doing like a six episode arc with the game Still Fleet, which is not out yet, but they have a quick start guide on their uh, website. Uh, it was written by Wythe Marshall and it's set in space hundred, you know, a couple hundred years in the future. Um, I get to play a really fun pilot character named Mercus. So I hope that we will be able to finish it by this Friday. But if not this Friday, we will have a double length episode next Friday. So you can just, you know, gobble it all up at once. <laughs> Fundraiser for skate camera drone. Yeah, okay, sure. But then I don't really want to pay attention to a drone while I'm skating. That would be kind of like too much on my brain. Skating requires a lot of brain power, actually. <laughs> Um, let's see, this week on Patreon, I posted about making mochi, a confetti crunch egg salad. Uh, I had a monthly update of recommendations for music and videos and projects. It's a pretty good summary and has some opportunities to collaborate or um, contribute to some of the projects that I have going on. Um, culinary word of the day, I've got four episodes in the can, which is very exciting. The next one is coming out tomorrow. You can follow the Twitter, Culinary WOTD. Uh, you can submit a word. Thank you to those of you who already submitted a word. I also added a $25 Patreon tier uh, to get four shoutouts on the podcast per month. That's pretty good, I think. Um, we have our first sort of large donor patron uh, named Yatrick, and he, instead of plugging his projects or him, he wanted to... Uh, promote a fundraiser, an art fundraiser for Restaurant Workers Community Foundation. And um, it's kind of a fund that will support essential workers. And it's really, really cool. Um, and I like that we can use my Patreon tiers as like doing good in the world. So that made me feel really, feel really great. Really, really, really nice. Um, so tons of links below the video. Um, those are the ways to support me. Uh, rules for the chat and all that. Uh, all the nuts and bolts are there. Cool. Um, let's take a look at what y'all cooked this week. Let's see. There's lots of stuff this week. Um, Jeff made some tasso grits. You can see here. Tasso is a smoked 
uh, pork product. It's very popular in the South. Look at these grits. Um, he also showed me a giant heirloom tomato that he grew in this garden. <laughs> I can't wait to get the photo of what he does with that. It's a gigantic tomato. Look at it. So nice. Um, Kevin sent along uh, some bitter melon. Remember when we talked about bitter melon uh, a couple weeks ago? Uh, he's making this dish with pork belly and bitter melon. That sounds real good. Uh, we got Lucius's lunch. Some salmon, tomato, parmesan, right? Cremini mushroom. Yum. You're so healthy, Lucius. <laughs> Uh, we have Martin's eggy, eggy hash with tomato and onion. Yum. Good breakfast options here. Uh, Vance sent along a stuffed pepper with rice and sausage. Look at that. Look at that. Um, this is the Zrazi from Kate's pop-up last weekend. It's a potato dough, dumpling dough that is uh, fried on both sides and it's stuffed with hard-boiled egg, dill, and onion. Wow, it was really good. And it came with a chipotle yogurt dipping sauce. Very good combinations all around. I know, I know, you can't help being healthy. Gotta look out, gotta look out. Okay, let's see what I did this week. Um, last night I made some chicken tenders. They are coated in uh, cornstarch. Excuse me. Achoo! Achoo! Ay! Ooh, hope I'm not allergic to this photo. <laughs> um, and then I melted some butter and mixed it with a maple cayenne hot sauce to make sort of my own version of a buffalo sauce. So did you know that buffalo, uh, buffalo wing flavor is just butter and Frank's Red Hot sauce? So you can make your own sort of buffalo style sauce with any hot sauce and a pat of butter and then pour it over your chicken like so. Uh, I also made a sandwich. This is a very large sandwich. This is a, a square of tomato focaccia from uh, Mel the Bakery pop-up here in Brooklyn. Um, she partnered with the Meat Hook. Uh, her name is actually Nora, not Mel, uh, <laughs> but the bakery is called Mel, uh, and uh, she uses this sourdough to make focaccia, and I did, um, you see, see carrot ribbons, uh, strawberry mustarda, and some pea shoots. This was, like, really fluffy. I probably should have pressed it in a panini press, because uh, it was very, like, tall, <laughs> but whatever. Um... I published a recipe for a sausage chili on my blog last week, and my friend Gray said, uh, I just saw your Tumblr about sausage chili. Let me tell you, as a Midwest Midwesterner, Bob Evans sausage should be a replacement for plain ground protein for so many things. Chili? You bet. Pizza? Absolutely. Queso? Yeah. <laughs> what does he say here? I covered it up accidentally. Oops. Where is it? Get ready to taste God. <laughs> Thank you, Gray, for that suggestion. <laughs> um, I also made a uh, mango slushy. You just take like frozen fruit and blend it with ice and a little sugar, and you get slushy. Very easy. Amazing. Oh, thanks, Pixel Riffs. Nice to see ya. Welcome to the chat. Pixel Riffs is a Minecraft streamer and uh, a friend of Fun City. So thank you for joining. Uh, we also have, oh, I made a, I had a bunch of puff pastry in the freezer. And so I baked it off and put uh, with some uh, marshmallow cream cheese frosting that I had laying around in the fridge. I have a lot of random stuff in my fridge. And so <laughs> I baked this puff pastry with this marshmallow uh, icing on top. And it had this like kind of Danish texture. And then when I took it out, I served it to myself. I talk about as if I'm serving other people. I'm serving serve it to myself uh, with that strawberry mustarda that I made uh, last week. Looks pretty. And I guarantee you, my mustarda does not have mold. I don't know if you saw this new news item. 
Um, but that restaurant in L.A., a uh, squirrel was caught uh, with like photos of jam that had like layers of mold. And uh, the health inspector said that it was still or at least they say allegedly that that they were allowed to serve the jam if they just scooped the mold off. I don't know if y'all know anything about microbiology, but mold likes to hold on to things. It's, it's like, mold is not something that just sits on a surface. When it hits something porous like bread or fruit, um, it digs, you know, digs down. On cheese, it's a beneficial mold. That is something specifically cultivated in the cheese. But when it's ambient mold, like from an air conditioner or from a fan in the case of this restaurant, um, that is not beneficial mold. That is something from the outside that was not part of the manufacturing process. And so they're in a lot of hot water right now. If you are curious uh, uh, to read the story, the restaurant is called S-Q-I-R-L, Squirrel, <laughs> Squirrel Jam. Um, and it's a, it's a little harrowing um, Imagine if you lived in L.A. and you ate at that restaurant and that, that news piece came out. You'd be, like, freaking out, right? Like, I ate that mold. Ah. Yeah, mold has tendrils. Exactly, exactly. Anyway, that was a tangent. Um, this is one of the breads I picked up from Mel the Bakery. <laughs> Look, it's my son. My sourdough Hokkaido milk bread. This is very relevant because um, next week's culinary word of the day is tong zhang, which is a baking technique that that helps Hokkaido milk bread rise up like this big. So you, we'll learn about that next week. Very cool. Um, I had to air dry a chicken for, for work this week, and I need your opinion. Do you think that this looks like an uncle have an arrest. Doesn't it look like an uncle like sitting on a stool? <laughs> Doesn't it look like he's just chilling? <laughs> um, there is a can of seltzer that is covered in multiple layers of plastic in the cavity of the chicken so it can sit up like that. Like it's kind of like beer can chicken. But instead of cooking it, I'm actually air drying it in the fridge so that it will get a, a crackly crust. Just like, so the more water that we um, leach out from it, we let the skin air dry without any plastic covering, um, the crispier it should be. Uh, I'm, I'm testing this for, for work. <laughs> um, I also had a meatball sub with garlic scape pesto the other day. I mean, don't let the image deceive you. That is a hot dog bun. It's not some fancy roll or crusty baguette. It's a hot dog bun. You can do anything with hot dog buns. You can have meatball subs in them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then for some fun video stuff, uh, my friends Sarah and Emily, uh, they were the last people that I, I had a dinner party with before quarantine. And uh, this Sunday, we decided to have a socially distanced, like, dinner party. And so we, ha we were in a kitchen big enough where we could all be apart and wear our masks. And uh, Sarah made mole. And this is slow-mo of the mole. And then shortly after this video, my friend Joe, it's in a playlist. I'm, I'm still troubleshooting OBS. <laughs> so Joe sent me this video of him making a torta sandwich. That was very quick. And the aspect ratio was all weird. But anyway, here's the mole again. <laughs> it does look like it's dancing. It's slow mo mole. Slow mole. Slow mole. Hey, Josh. Welcome to the chat. Slow mole. <laughs> Glad to see you. Oh, so many good friends. Ah. Oh. Okay, so that's what I've been up to this week. Um, how about everybody in the chat? Um, for those of you who did not submit photos, um, let us know what you've been eating this week, like a highlight. Did you cook something yourself? Did you order something this week? We love talking about food on this stream. Uh, everybody in the chat is a fan of food. So um, let us know what you've been eating. I want to hear it. I want to know. 
um, while I queue up some photos here. Today, we are tackling three subjects. We're talking about cherries, um, health benefits of cherries, what to do with them, um, list of suggestions of things to find in Asian markets. This was really, really fun. Uh, I asked my Twitter and Facebook communities about uh, their opinion, and boy, did everyone have a shopping list. It was amazing. And then we're also going to talk about kind of an ancillary subject from last week. So we talked an hour. We talked for an hour about charcuterie. Um, and so this time we also wanted to talk about terrines, which is a, a slice of um, the charcuterie category. Uh, so that's going to be really fun. I have some books to support that too. So I'm excited to talk about all this stuff, friends. I just need to zoom in on my documents and make sure that I have everything I need first. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, Lucia just roasted tomatoes with basil and parmesan. Yum. Oh, you bought too much basil again today? Even from that whole plant you had last week? <laughs> oh, man. That's great. All right. Let's get into some cherries, friends. So let me, let me get my ingredient photo of cherries. Cherries! Look at them! Cherries! How many of you like cherries, and how many of you dislike cherries? Ooh, you got some sweet corn today, too? I got some corn as well. Yeah, I love cherries, too. All right. Let's get technical, friends. A cherry is the fruit of many plants in this genus called prunus. Uh, and not to be confused with prunes or plums. Those are different, <laughs> different fruits. But um, the stone fruit, the cherry itself, is called a fleshy droop, D-R-U-P-E, a fleshy droop. And it makes sense because the cherries, like, hang from a stem. They, dro they literally droop, but not D-R-O-O-P. The actual fruit is called a D-R-U-P-E. <laughs> okay. Yes, we do love them for the antioxidants. Mmm. Uh, you don't get them very often. You like them, and cherry yogurt. Ch cherry yogurt is your favorite. Yes, yes, yes. You like cherries, but not cherry flavored things. I. Huh. I can't remember the last time I had a cherry flavored thing. But I think I agree with you. Oh, oh, wait, no. I love those gas station um, cherry pies that have the the hard icing on the outside. Drupal, like the web. <laughs> no, I'm getting like shell shocked from thinking about Drupal, the web product. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, anyway, um, so commercial cherries are obtained from cultivars of several species, um, but they mostly divide into two families, which are the sweet and the sour. So sweet prunus avium and the sour prunus serrasus. Those are the two, two classes. So the English word cherry derives from Old Northern French, uh, cheris, C-H-E-R-I-S-E. And from the Latin cerasum, yeah, cerasum, C-E-R-A-S-U-M. Yes, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and they came to Rome in about 72 BC by Lucius Licinius Lucullus. What a name, Lucius. <laughs> Lucius Licinius Lucullus. Uh, he was from northeastern Anatolia um, and brought cherries to Rome. Wow. They, uh, cherries arrived in North America in Brooklyn <laughs> when it was under Dutch sovereignty. Very cool that we were the... First ever borough, first ever city to get cherries. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Gas station cherry pies are pretty delectable, but yeah, I don't want to read the ingredients. It's very small, fine print. <laughs> um, did you know that 
Uh, cherries originated in both Europe and Western Asia kind of simultaneously. Um, they take about three to four years once they are planted to produce first crops of fruit. And it takes seven years to attain that full like cherry tree maturity where it's producing all the time. And so that sounds crazy because asparagus, you know, those stalks take about a year to come out of the ground. And then um, pineapples take about like, or palm trees take about 20 years to grow to adulthood. So this falls in the middle, you know, three to four years. Um, faster planting things like tomatoes take like not even a couple weeks. So uh, cherries are kind of an investment, which I, I you know, they make sense. They're delicious. Um, in the southern, well, so, okay, cherries, they blossom in April. That's why we have cherry blossom festivals around, the, around that time in the northern hemisphere. Um, and our peak season is, guess what, the summer. It's very exciting. Uh, we're going to have lots of cherries coming into the farmer's markets. In the southern hemisphere, however, cherries are usually at their peak in late December and widely associated with Christmas. We think of cherries as like a summer treat, like in the hot sun. Um, but in the southern hemisphere, it's hemisphere, it's it's the opposite. It's like it's, it's a Yuletide tradition <laughs> to eat cherries. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Uh, in the United States, the most sweet cherries are grown in Washington, California, Oregon, Wisconsin, and Michigan. That doesn't mean they're not growing in other states. It's just that's where the mass production is happening. Uh, when I was little, we were picking cherries in Brentwood, California. How many of you have uh, picked cherries before? It's really fun. You get buckets and you just your mouth gets all red from, <laughs> from eating them on the way. It's really fun. Uh, let's see. Most, okay. So the names of like sweet cherry cultivars that you might know. Bing, Ulster, Rainier, Brooks, Tular, King, and Sweetheart. I've only had two of those. Um, Bing and Rainier are the ones that are, you're going to find uh, in the Whole Foods. You know, Rainier are like the peachy looking ones. They look like Yoshi fruit or like a, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? They're like peachy with like a red tinge instead of being completely red like this. Uh, and then Oregon and Michigan uh, grow like Royal Ann um, and sour cherries, like uh, sour tart cherries. I don't have the species names for those. Oh, no, I do. Uh, Nanking and Evans. Do you guys have a guess for where the cherry capital of the world is? The cherry capital of the world is not on, in any coastal city. I'll let y'all in the, in the chat try to figure it out. Uh, most cherry varieties have a chilling requirement of 800 or more hours, meaning that in order to break dormancy, blossom, and set fruit, the winter season needs to have at least 800 hours where the temperature is below 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That is like heavy, that's like a heavy sweater weather, right? Kind of, not quite winter jacket, but sweater weather. Double, double sweater letter? <laughs> Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So Traverse City, Michigan is the cherry capital of the world. They host a national cherry festival and make the world's largest cherry pie. I really wouldn't have thought Traverse City. Yeah. <laughs> mm, so... Raw sweet cherries are about 82% water, 16% carbohydrates, 1% protein, uh, and they provide like little nutrient content per 100 gram serving. Um, they have like a little bit of fiber and a little bit of vitamin C. I wouldn't go to cherries for that, but you know, it makes sense that they're refreshing in the summer because they are 82% water. Pretty good. Pretty good. And uh, you already mentioned in the chat, cherries contain antioxidants. Those are known as anthrocyanins and cyanidin, which may have those anti-inflammatory uh, anti effects. And initial research has shown that these 
antioxidants could be beneficial in inflammatory conditions such as arthritis, although more research is needed to replicate these results in human studies. Haven't done enough cherry human study research, friends. Uh, research by the British Journal of Nutrition found that cherry juice might help reduce blood pressure due to its high polyphenol content. Great to know. Um, and, <coughs> excuse me, research by the Journal of the International Society of Sport Nutrition found that drinking tart cherry juice for seven days before and during strenuous running events minimized post-run muscle pain. So, like, you know, instead of, like, dying with all that lactic acid in your in your muscles um you could just drink a bunch of cherry juice and hope that you don't get as much cramps <laughs> another small study found that tart cherry juice appears to aid recovery and muscle function after strenuous exercise hmm. i guess the only downfall to this um is that cherries are small fruit you know and they require processing because they have a pit and so cherry juice tends to be a little bit more expensive. So if you are really into exercise and want to try, you know, reducing your muscle strain or soreness, you can try cherry juice, but be aware that you're paying for, you know, a premium. <laughs> Cherries will probably take a while to process. Oh, you have some fresh cherry jam from Robin's Backyard? Hell yeah, that sounds delicious. There has been some slightly mixed research as to whether cherries, and specifically cherry juice, are beneficial to those who have trouble sleeping, but the signs are encouraging. Research by the European Journal of Nutrition found that tart cherry juice is beneficial in improving sleep both in quality and duration. Um, so it may be benefit to those who have disturbed sleep, uh, while another small study suggests that cherry juice may be beneficial to those with insomnia. So. I know uh, the past couple months have been really hard for everyone, but maybe we just need a little bit of cherry juice. It's a thought to consider, maybe. Oh, you're eating a slice of cherry pie? Excuse me, Lucius, dang. Okay, so uh, let's look at, I have found this book called History of the World in Five Menus uh, and the cherry stone, it says here, can survive for a long time. Stones were found in a Neolithic sited in Dareth, Kent. Uh, so we can assume that wild cherries existed right across Europe. The sour cherries has more of a little bit limited range. Uh, blah, 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 origin of the name. I'm going to move this clip up a little bit more. Let's see. The cherry was one of the trees in the ancient gardens of Persia called the Pairi Daisa, from which comes our word paradise. I like that. Uh, 4,000 BC pottery shows the distinctive shape of the four-part Persian garden with the pool of life in the middle, but our earliest archaeological records come from 2,000 years later. Irrigation was the key to those garden oases and to the later hanging gardens of Babylon. These were built by Nebuchadnezzar, the second around 600 BC, supposedly pleased his wife. Haha, <laughs> please his wife. Uh, Amethyst, who begged for this reminder of her Persian home. Wow. The cherry was eaten by ancient Greeks and Romans. Theophrastus, in his 3rd century BC history of plants, mentioned that they had been known for centuries. Pliny the Elder writes in his natural history that the Roman general Lucullus, Lucius Lucullus, let me say, uh, brought cultivated cherries to Italy around 74 BC from Pontus in modern Anatolia. Pliny mentions eight varieties as being grown, which suggests a long history of cultivation. Uh, the cherry was a favorite of Roman legionnaires, and cherries were planted within easy reach of the major roads. <gasps> Can you imagine? Can you imagine hiking and just walking along a path that just had free cherries? Wow. The stones of sour cherries are one of the many food residues that have been found in the ashes of Pompeii. Wow. That is amazing. That is so cool. Um, okay, and I also have a screenshot of tons of cherry varieties. Of the ones that I mentioned that were grown domestically in the U.S., I've only ever had two. That is the Bing and the Rainier. Um, but there seem to be a lot of other species here. 
Wow. Western cherry, laurel, bird cherry, European bird cherry, pin cherry, Antilles cherry, mountain cherry, Chinese sour cherry, false cherry, sand cherry, Himalayan cherry. <laughs> there are so many different kinds. Uh, has anyone ever had, outside of Bing and Rainier, do you know the names of your cherries? Um, those are literally the only two I've ever had. This is just one half of the list, so the other half of the list is here. Clove cherry. Um, a sweet cherry is the one uh, that is like kind of Bing cherry. There's a Taiwan cherry, a gray leaf, Carolina laurel, wild Himalayan, the sour. So crazy. There's so many cherries. Japanese bird cherry, Korean cherry, Manchurian cherry, St. Lucie cherry. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. You've had black cherry, Wisniak, and Royal Anne cherries. All right, all right. Wow. So, commercial production, uh, sour cherries. They're frozen or canned and used in sauces and pastries. Sweet cherries, um, we love consuming them fresh. Uh, they're the particular... The type of cherry used in uh, maraschino liquor or maraschino cherries. Uh, and let's talk about what we like to do with cherries. Let me know, friends. What do you? How do you like to eat your cherries? I mean, besides cold from a bowl. <laughs> Get my cherry background again. So, while I love pie. Uh, I think that it's a lot of work, and I have an argument that uh, we should start making more clafouti. Do you know what clafouti is? It's, it's a less, you know, effort kind of pie situation. It's more of a cherry custard where, uh, yeah, you, you cook the cherries in a single layer with the custard um, instead of dealing with pie pastry. Like, I'm not, I'm not an enthusiastic baker. <laughs> I, I will do it if I am forced to, but <laughs> I argue that we should be making more clafouti over pie. But pie is also good. I will eat it if somebody else makes it. You can have cherries in smoothies. You can have them in cocktails. You can have them in sodas and lemonades. Uh, you can have them in blondies. You know what blondies are? They're the uh, sort of white version of brownies. So blondies, brownies. You can have cherry brownies. You can have cherry blondies. You can have them in a cobbler, in a fool, or in a trifle. Um, they really work well in sweet desserts. They work well with cream. They infuse very well. Um, you can have them in black forest cake. You can have them on a cheesecake. In ice cream, yes. Cherry soda, cherry and fruit cups. Oh yeah, fruit cups. When was the last time you had a fruit cup? I don't know. It's been a while. Uh, but cherries also have a lot of savory application as well. We've got, let's see, you can pickle them with cinnamon and rosemary. I highly, highly recommend that combination. Uh, you can put them in a uh, barbecue sauce. A lot of those sticky rib barbecue sauces have fruit in them, like apricot or plum. Cherries can go in there as well. Um, Korean barbecue sauce or marinades have grated apple in them, so why not cherries? You can make a cherry salsa. Like, can you imagine a pico de gallo with some ice cold fresh cherries? You can make a chutney. You can make mustarda, lots of condiments. Um, cherry vinegar, cherry jam, cher cherry jelly, <laughs> cherry jello. And here are a few items that I've made with cherries. Um, this one's in my cookbook. We have a cherry chocolate meatball. Yeah. So it's got dried cherries that have been soaking in liquor and then mixed with the meatball mix, cooked, and then we've got chocolate shaved over it. So I'm taking that idea of like cherry chocolate as a dessert and putting it into a savory situation. And it's not too sweet, you know, um, sugar and meat isn't wrong. A lot of, um, you know, orange chicken, lemon chicken, um, 
plum sauce, duck sauce, all those sauces have lots of sugar in them. So I'm actually putting in less sugar than in a lot of those like commercial sauces. So it works. It's pretty good. And then, how about a cherry pizza? This is a uh, tomato. I did San Marzano, Marzano t tomatoes on the bottom layer. Um, there is sausage, there's crumbled sausage. There's chive, uh, mozzarella, parmesan, the cherries I put on afterward, like after it came out of the oven. And then I drizzled some uh, Mike's hot honey over it. Cherry pizza, y'all. Mmm. Would I use only, would I use sour cherries for cooking? Only for cooking. Um, I actually don't use them very often. Uh, the sourness sort of mellows when you bake it. And that's why uh, they've sort of fallen into like mostly just cooking and not like drinks and simple syrups. But I don't know, there's room for experimentation there. Not sure. Oh, wait, wrong. Ooh, maybe with some banana peppers. Yes, I love me some banana peppers. For sure. For sure, for sure. Love it. Love talking about cherries. This was great. Let's put an egg on me to celebrate. Poached egg. Yes. Let's move on to our next uh, segment, which is uh, suggestions of items to get at the Asian market. So this blew up on my social. Like on Facebook, I had over like 60 comments on it. And on Twitter, there were like 30. It was amazing. But for me personally, I will tell you um, what I like to get from Asian markets. Uh, you might not find them at, at yours, but you know, keep an eye out. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite, favorite items is called Nagaraya Garlic Cracker nut, Cracker Nuts. They are peanuts that have like a crunchy cracker layer, and then they're tossed in like a garlic MSG powder. So it's like Dorito level <laughs> flavor of garlic on these like crunchy peanut things. I have a hard time like keeping them for more than a day because I will finish them within the day. <laughs> like I, as soon as I get home, I'll rip open the bag and be like, oh, I should only have a few. And then the bag is gone. Isn't that the thing with snacks though? I know it's very dangerous. Um, another snack that I love is called boy bawang. Uh, bawang is a Tagalog word for garlic. And uh, boy bawang is corn nuts, basically. It's, it's garlic flavored corn nuts. I don't know if you're sensing a pattern here with me, but <laughs> I kind of love garlic. <laughs> um, another thing I love to get from Chinatown is green papaya. So bright green, no yellow tinge, no pinkiness. Green unripe papaya is like a potato or it's like chayote. Um, it acts like a tuber it acts like a potato but it's just not as creamy um it's very close to a turnip even though they are not the same thing like papayas grow on trees turnips are rhizomes that are roots of a plant that hold water and energy um but the texture of a green papaya is so good in soups uh, my family has taught me to make a, a papaya pickle with green papaya it's called achara I've written an article about it. You can Google that later. Um, but I love picking those up. At least one will last you for like ever. It will make like a quart and a half of pickle. <laughs> you can like cut the papaya in half, peel it, seed it, and then uh, freeze half because you won't be able to finish the whole thing in one day <laughs> or in one sitting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so the Nagaraya um, cracker nuts. They have like barbecue flavor, adobo flavor, and just like a salted, a salted MSG flavor. But you gotta get the garlic. The, it's in the green package. The garlic is the best one. Uh, I love haichu. Haichu is like the Japanese version of like a starburst. <laughs> they come in so many flavors. I think the last one I got was watermelon flavor. I kind of love how fake it is. I don't know. 
Uh, it's really, it's really good. Did you know that Haichu was invented to, um, I don't know, sort of, kind of, it was meant to be like gum, except that you could swallow it. Like, you can chew on Haichu for a while. Uh, <laughs> that's what it was invented for. But you could swallow, it was like gum you could swallow. Which is so cute. Uh, of course, we talked about Lao Gan Ma Chili Crisp for a while. Uh, always pick one up. I always have a jar in my house. Um, Lao Gan Ma is a big company, so they have a whole line of products like black bean sauce, fermented things, um, like Szechuan chili oil, like that kind of stuff. Um, they have all kinds of products. You can check them out, but my favorite is the Chili Crisp. It is very addictive. Um, if I can find them, I love buying fresh shiso leaves. Those are Japanese mint. They're like big, they're like this big. Um, and they're so good. If you make like pork barbecue at home, you can grab a shiso leaf and like eat it like a taco. Um, you can also do that with uh, sesame leaves or perilla, perilla leaves. That's like a Korean style of eating, eating barbecue. Um, I really like those big like puffy shiitake mushrooms i don't know there's something about the texture of them that i like it's very meaty like the the shiitake mushrooms at whole foods are just like real wimpy you know like i don't know the ones at the asian stores are like always so like hefty really like them uh also picks up pick up some gochujang you know to make kimchi uh and I always browse the snack and dry noodle aisle for like new flavors. I haven't really found one that I really, really like. Uh, I don't like that angry chicken brand. Like I've tried two of their items and it was like way too spicy. It's like comically spicy, like not even fun or enjoyable kind of spicy. <laughs> it's like too much. Um, so a few highlights from Twitter. Uh, Teague says he gets uh, Sichuan flavored kiki noodles and bitter squash. Hooray. Uh, Petra likes getting century eggs, which are um, long time fermented eggs. They're like jelly like by the time they're done curing. And my friend Julia gets a big bucket of uh, lychee jelly cups. So it's like a little cuppy of, of jello with a tiny square piece of lychee fruit on the inside. <laughs> I used to get those at restaurants, like instead of a fortune cookie at the end of the meal, um, sometimes in Southern California, we'd get like a little lychee jelly cup instead. So fun. Uh, I have a ton of screenshots that I'm going to share with you. Um, ha, I like big mushrooms and I cannot lie. True, true. Uh, Lucius really loves the Calbee shrimp chips, even though they're full of MSG. Yeah, I totally grew up with those, but I can't eat too many of them now it's so crazy that when I was little I would eat whole bags of them like bag and a half two bags and now I can barely handle a ha handful of that kind of salt yeah uh, what else okay screenshots from friends let's check it out where did I put them ah they're here so, this is from Facebook. Lizzie says, frozen saba, which is a small banana, dried Philippine mango, sky flakes, it's a Filipino saltine cracker that has coconut oil in it, just so you know. Uh, lumpia wrapper, it's another name for very thin egg roll wrappers. Um, sweet corn balls, so we have like a, like a Cheeto-like ball, but it's sweet corn flavored. Uh, Laura says, Chili Crisp, of course, A plus number one. Uh, Pocky, Pocky, if you've never had Pocky, it's like a, a cookie cracker that's a stick that's dipped in chocolate. And sometimes they have limited edition flavors like um, green tea or like they'll dip it in almond chunks or like strawberry cheesecake. I've had a few of the Pretz, like Pretz brand, which is like a savory version of Pocky. They have like Thai basil or Tom Yum soup flavor, pizza flavor. <laughs> love a snack, love an Asian snack, right? Uh, Emily here says Korean rice cakes, Japanese curry cubes, gailan, which is what we talked about last week, uh, boba, tofu, kimchi, uh, shrimp cracker, haichu, yeah. 
Beach mushrooms. I actually don't know the know about beach mushrooms. Curious. Uh, Nata de coco, mangoes, frozen dumpling. Oh, frozen dumplings are like clutch, right? Uh, black sesame almond milk. It's from Kate. Um, this one blew my mind. Andy Bio showed me a photo of brown sugar boba ice cream. I've never seen this and I want it. He said that he found it at H Mart, but I have yet to confirm that it is stocked at the H Mart in, uh, in New York. I don't know. But if you live near an H Mart, I would love to know if, if they have these in stock. Brown sugar boba ice cream. Uh, sounds so good. Uh, my friend Sang has this monthly grocery store like list. This is her monthly list. And she goes to Tan Tin, Hua, Tan Ting, Tan Ting Hung in Chinatown. Excuse me. Um, she says it's cash only. Uh, she does dry, meat, seasoning, flour, canned. This is like amazing. Like Thai basil, fried tofu, bean sprout, belut. B-E-L-U-T is eel. B-A-L-U-T, balut, is um, fermented duck egg. So belut and balut are two different things. Uh, grass jelly, almond jelly, tapioca jelly, coconut milk, jackfruit. <sighs> <sighs> So much sauce. I can't believe she gets this stuff monthly. She must go through so much food for a family of three. Wow. Wow. Okay. So there's there's so many opinions here. Laksa, natto, which is a fermented uh, soybean, fresh ramen noodles. In New York, if you live in New York, sun noodle. You got to get sun noodle. It's the freshest local ramen noodle that we have. Uh, green tea ice cream, Tom Kha spice packets, yes, yes, yes. Taiwan beer. Have you ever had Taiwan beer? It's like really drinkable and good. It's better than PBR. Also about probably the same price. Milk bread. Yeah, milk bread for sure. Uh, Malika has a really great uh, piece of advice here when she buys the Thai bird peppers because uh, usually at stores, Thai bird pepper is like really small. Uh, so they're sold in like large packs and so you can't possibly get through that many peppers in one week before they start like drying out um, so she puts them in the freezer and some of the dishes that she makes with it is pad ki mao or pad ziyu wow cool love it good advice malika uh makali makali is like a relatively new Thing seeping into our consciousness here in the U.S. Uh, makali is a Korean rice wine. It's kind of like nigori sake. Nigori is an unfiltered sake. Uh, it's a little sweeter. And makali is like carbonated. And you eat it with, you drink it with like Korean barbecue. And my friends, Martin knows this, we, we will put away four bottles or so during a night of Korean barbecue. Um, so you can get them more at like Korean, Korean markets. Uh, yuzu kosho is so good. If you haven't had this condiment, it's like wasabi mixed with yuzu, which is the Japanese citrus. Uh, ooh, chocolate covered almonds. Yes. Yum. So many screenshots here. So many people had opinions. Tocino flavored spam, which I tried um, last month. It's really good. Uh, dry noodles. Wow. Jasmine rice. Yes. Uh, Hall Flakes, H-A-W Flakes. Um, I forgot that I knew what those were. It's like a, a candy. Uh, they look like they're Chinese firecrackers in the packaging, but they're just like fruit candy that's like in these little uh, purple discs. We have Lucius here saying toasted sesame oil. Marley says shredded dried squid. Uh, this had an endorsement from both Drip my friend Rachel Viola and Daniel Davis. Fresh fried dace with salted black beans. So it's a canned fish with bean in it. I've never tried that. Uh, real sriracha sauce. Thailand shark brand. Thai curry paste. Yes, 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 yes. Wild lime leaves. Yes, yes, yes. So good. Yeah, another another vote for Laogan Ma Chili Crisp. 
uh, fresh burdock root. I don't know if you've... I've never really played with burdock root myself. Um, Mizuna greens are very beautiful. They're like pointy salad greens. Uh, I actually don't know some of these things on Kevin's list. <laughs> but I do like a black vinegar uh, and perilla, perilla oil. That's sesame oil, basically. Uh, let's see. Roasted and salted seaweed. Vegetarian sacha sauce. Wow. Bamboo and chili oil. I've never bought a can of bamboo and chili oil, but I've always seen it. Wow. Uh, Miwon or MSG. Yes, you can buy packets of MSG from stores. We got a few more here. Jeremiah, my friend, says bonito, sesame oil, kongjaban, nori maki arare. Oh, those are the crackers. <gasps> those are the rice crackers that are covered in seaweed. Yes. Uh, miso paste, sambal olek. Yes, yes, yes. And then my friend Alex, who's in Texas, Szechuan peppercorns and mala oil. I'm addicted to that stuff. I, am, I love that stuff. Wow. Uh, whatever popsicles have the best absurd packaging. <laughs> Same goes for gummy candy. Um, one of my favorite ice creams to get at Asian stores is called Melona, which is a K Korean brand. It is a creamy melon ice cream on a stick. Uh, I think they have some strawberry flavor too, but the brand is called Melona. And uh, I'll, I'll have to pull up the picture another time, but I, I met them, I met the brand at like a conference once, and like I got to hug this giant Melona popsicle statue while eating one. I, I was so, I was so stoked. <laughs> and it's the color of my green, this green below my, my video here. Uh, it's like my favorite color, so Melona bars of my own heart. <laughs> what? How did you miss this? Did you walk away? Oh, this segment was for you. <laughs> I still got a bunch to go here. We have Katsuo Fumi Furikake for boiled eggs. That is a Japanese spice mix that you can sprinkle onto eggs, onto rice, onto anything, onto your soups, onto your salads. It has a nice crunch and it has pieces of seaweed chopped into it. Um, ramune, oh, ramune is like the Japanese soda. It's like not as sweet as like American soda, but it has this fun little marble mechanism. You like put a top on it and it pops. It's like really fun. Um, Kit Kats, yes, especially at Japanese markets. They have like a million flavors of Kit Kat. Um, I saw a cherry blossom flavor recently, cookies and cream flavor, matcha tea flavor is super, super good. Um, what else? Melty blend chocolate. I don't know what that is. <gasps> Boaten rice candy. I haven't had that in decades. I used to get that at the, the Filipino store when I was little. Like, there are these little red and green boxes. The chewy rice candy. Oh, I love that stuff. Um, Lauren says, sweet potato glass noodles. Yes. Yes. Uh, what is... Japche. That's the dish you make with sweet potato glass noodles. It's a Korean uh, cold noodle dish. Very good. It's very close to Filipino pancit, except that the noodles aren't cooked in the broth. The glass noodles are just constituted and mixed with, with mushroom and vegetables. Let's see, what else we got here? Kombu, seaweed tempura crisps. I love those. I love those sweet seaweed tempura chips, but they're so expensive. It's like half an ounce of material in the bag the, the bag is like mostly air and it's like four dollars three dollars like so worth it sometimes though when you really have the hankering for it um pickled mustard greens yes 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 um in taiwanese cuisine um pickled mustard greens are served in rice bowls so if you have like a ground beef dish um usually there's some chopped pickled mustard green on top of the rice with the meat or like if you deep fried a pork chop over rice and then uh, you had a little bit of pickle mustard green to counteract that, that fatty texture. Um, so it's, it's really good. I, I endorse that. 
Uh, pickled daikon for curry. Salted duck eggs for congee. Yes, yes, yes. A bottle of bickle. I don't know what bickle is. Have to look that up. We also got Vermont curry cubes. I've actually learned how to make my own curry cubes. Uh, I actually have some here. So uh, Tejal Rao, who is a writer for the New York Times, actually has a recipe for making your own curry cubes at home. So I've got them here. Mine are uh, pretty flaky, and you can hear that they just fell apart. Uh, I was missing a few ingredients, but it still makes Japanese curry. Amazing. Mm. Uh, what else? So Nigel is a former coworker of mine who has impeccable, impeccable taste in food. And so I was really happy to see his opinion here. Taiwan beer, again, mentioned black vinegar. Yes, yes, yes. And gnocchi mushrooms. Have you ever had those? Um, they're like little baby bunches of white mushrooms that are like sold as little bundles. Um, what else? Literally every brand of instant noodle. Yes. Um, frozen scallion pancake, frozen dumpling. Chip, ship, 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 ships with flavors only found in Asia. Yes, yes, yes. Um, I've never seen this Tohato caramel corn. Wow. Strawberry. Strawberry caramel corn? That sounds great. Yes. Uh, good pantry staples. Gochujang, kombu, miso, shiitakes, and mirin. Especially dried shiitakes. Actually, this whole um, suggestion line from Robert Michael... Um, those are excellent long-term pantry items. Um, mirin doesn't have to be refrigerated. Uh, dried shiitakes just need to be kept like in a sealed container, like unrefrigerated. Miso does need to be refrigerated, but it lasts forever. Uh, I always have a tub of it in my fridge. Um, kombu is also dry storage. It's, it's seaweed. Uh, kombu is the basis of dashi which is the bonito broth that is used in uh, ramen. So like authentic, authentic ramen always starts with a layer of dashi broth. So kombu is an essential part of that. But did you also know that you can pickle with kombu? There's like a turnip pickle recipe with kombu. And you can also cure fish on kombu. So if you get sushi grade fish, you can lay it out on a piece of kombu in the fridge for a day and it will be a little bit salt cured and you can slice that and eat it raw. Good trick. I learned that from a sushi chef. Um, and then gochujang is just um, like a, a chili paste, Korean chili paste that you can use to ferment cabbage. You can ferment apples. You can ferment Asian pears. You can ferment any hearty greens. You can make kimchi out of anything. Um, there's a writer named Eric Kim who had something in the New York Times called Think of Kimchi as a Verb. You can kimchi most anything, which is very and a very exciting thought. I love that. Um, but yeah, those are a lot, a lot of recommendations from Asian markets. Uh, you can rewatch this segment if you missed the beginning another time. But yes, yes, yes. That was a lot of recommendations. I now have a very large shopping list the next time I go to an Asian market. <laughs> but what I do, though, is whenever I do go, I kind of have to set myself a budget and I walk the aisles looking for things I've never had before. So I generally do that in every grocery store that I go to. I, I try to walk down every aisle and just keep an eye out for things I've never had or like different international versions of things I've had. Um, yeah, just so I can try it uh, and, and learn more from it. I read a lot of ingredients and um, sometimes if I can't afford something or if it's out of my budget, I'll take a picture of the ingredients and then try to figure out how to do it myself later. So that's a fun, fun practice. I know it's really hard to write everything down. Ooh, you have 25 pounds of Thai jasmine rice. Hell yeah. I also have a 20 pounder, but I keep it in a, in a big plastic tub so I, with a measuring cup already in it so that I can just scoop into my rice cooker. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that I had room for um, 
the rice dispenser that my parents had. They had this like three foot tall um, rice dispenser that you could put like an entire like sack into and it had buttons for um, dispensing one cup, two cup, three cup. It was just my favorite thing to press those buttons when I was little. So I would press the buttons and play with it and then put all the rice back into the container and then do it again. <laughs> yeah. So fun, so, so fun. Okay, moving on, our last ingredient of the day or dish we're gonna talk about, excuse me, I might sneeze. Ah, I'm very, I have lots of allergies today. Excuse me, I'm, I might sneeze. Or maybe I lost it, I don't know. Ah, ah, I'm a fragile human being. <laughs> Pair the rice with? Oh my gosh, so many things go with rice. You could put an egg on it. You could put, you could have spam with it. You could have chorizo with it. You could have longanisa with it. You could do the pickled mustard green and um, a pork chop is a very Taiwanese dish. That's one of my favorites actually. Um, another Taiwanese dish that I really love is like deep fried popcorn chicken over rice with Mustard green? <laughs> real good, real good. Are you guys laughing at me that I couldn't sneeze? Damn. Damn. <laughs> okay. We are, well, actually, I have um, Jacques Pépin's Complete Techniques. This is a book that I learned a lot of French technique from. And I was going to check if there was any cherry stuff in here before we moved on. Just want to double check. Double check, double check. Cherries! It might not have cherries. Chestnuts. Oh, then no cherries. Okay, Jacques Pepin, whatever. <laughs> so we're moving on to terrines, which we briefly talked about last week. Um, it is a class of charcuterie. Oh, you are laughing at me playing with rice. Okay. Actually... That wasn't the only time that I played with rice, too. My preschool in Hercules, California, in, uh, they had a, um, a, standing, a standing sandbox. And instead of, instead of sand in the sandbox, it was actually rice with, like, boat toys and shovels. Um, we were allowed to, like, play with this rice all the time. And so that was my experience. We never had a sandbox. We had a rice box. Yeah, that was my preschool. Run by a, a white lady named Miss Bonnie. It's very cool. I mean, you could tell how strong the Asian community was around there, though. Yeah, true. Yeah, true, true. Sand is not easy to clean up. And it, yeah, we didn't have sand out in the playground, either. We had bark. It was a very woody area in Hercules. Um, okay, so, terrines. Let's, let's open this book. I'm going to read you some of, remember this book I brought out last week, Terrine, by Stéphane Reynaud? Stéphane Reynaud. Terrine is a celebration of how to prepare and enjoy many different varieties of this traditional rustic dish. Traditional to French people, excuse me. Um, which has been loved for generations as a hearty meal perfect for sharing among a family and friends. Stéphane Renaud, a celebrated French chef who comes from a family of butchers, has chosen the best of traditional and regional recipes in addition to a few more surprising dishes that explore a while. Blah, blah, blah. So, these are served as an appetizer, main course, or dessert. They combine traditions of rural French cooking with enthusiasm for modern cuisine that will guarantee a successful meal, whatever the occasion. Okay. So... Let's get to the meat of it. Haha, <laughs> the meat of it. There's no proper introduction here, buddy. Thought you would have some kind of tirade about, about uh, terrines. Nope, okay. So vegetables make the perfect terrines, not just for your vegetarian friends. The terrine packed with seasonal vegetables and herbs is guaranteed to delight all tastes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, how does this relate to charcuterie? All pâtés are terrines but not all terrines are pâtés. So a terrine is a dish of ground meat, organ meat, 
seafood, vegetables, boiled eggs, herbs, and or. So that's the key thing. And or other seasonings packed or layered in a ceramic or steel loaf mold, cooked in a water bath, cooled, and then turned out and sliced for serving. So it's kind of like savory cake making, you know, without baking. Uh, <laughs> sometimes an infused gelatin, uh, which is called aspic, is set on top for a decorative effect, but also adds a little bit of flavor and prevents the terrine or pate from oxidizing because the longer uh, offal meats or liver meats are exposed to air, they change colors, just so you know. I know, terrine is a meat cake. So terrines can be par-cooked, wrapped in puff pastry, and baked in croute. I actually have a photo of this. Pate in croute. I think I do. Where is it? <gasps> Maybe I didn't. I didn't upload it. Jen, what is wrong with you? I guess I didn't upload it. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> anyway, I have. I did have photos of my friend making a pate in croute, which is a pate in puff pastry. Oh well. Well, I will show you a chair, a carrot terrine that I made. From this book. So terrines can be vegetables um, but they can also be pâtés. So terrines is the class of charcuterie that includes pâtés but terrines don't necessarily have to have meat in them. So they're generally a force meat or aspic uh, that's cooked in a covered mold in a bain-marie. Do you know what a bain-marie is? Bain-marie is a water bath. So when you see that word bon marie, it means that you're getting like a casserole pan, um, putting the loaf pan of terrine inside of it, and then pouring hot water in the moat around it. It's like a hot water moat. And then you're baking it. Um, and what that does is steams the terrine evenly and gently. Because if you have a water bath, you're not applying direct heat in the oven to the terrine. Because if you were to do that, it would turn out to be meatloaf instead of a creamy, sliceable, like, meat cake situation. That's kind of the big difference, texture-wise, between meatloaf and a pate, or a country pate. Yeah. So, modern terrines do not necessarily contain meat or animal fat, but still contain meat-like texture and fat substitutes, like mushrooms and pureed fruit and vegetables that are high in pectin that make them stick together. Um, terrines are usually served cold or at room temperature. Um, they mostly contain a large amount of fat, although it's not the main ingredient. Um, the traditional country French versions have game meat or pheasant or hare. I've definitely made like rabbit terrines before. And when we talk about terrines, and there's this really interesting class dissonance when we talk about spam. Spam is technically a terrine. Um, the way that it's made, it is ground pork shoulder mixed with ham, back fat, and MSG. And then that is sealed into the can and the can is processed. Like, processed like um, preserved canning. So the tin is sealed and then it's like heated up so that the meat cooks inside. And that's why it has all that gelatin because no one has touched it since the raw meat went in. Um, so that if, if spam has ever bothered you, um, that is sort of the cooking technique where it comes from. Spam is a terrine. It is a French rustic technique that was pivoted to a use in wartime. Like canned food comes from war. So it's really fascinating that spam has like sort of this low class association, but it comes from a high fine dining idea. And briefly, just to touch on it, um, there are other items that you might confuse as terrines, but they're very different. So I talked about rillettes or riettes last week. Um, riettes are meat, fish, or poultry that's been chopped or shredded seasoned with salt and pepper, and then preserved slowly in its own fat. So I like to describe it as a preserved pulled pork or preserved pulled duck or shredded duck. Um, 
Yes. You can use it to make a spread for sandwiches. Um, you can dip crudite in it or stuff pasta like agnolotti or ravioli or totalini. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's a pretty traditional way of preserving meat. Um, it adds a lot of flavor and uh, it lasts for a while too. Uh, pâtés and terrines are smoother and usually use organ meat like liver. Uh, rillettes use meat from the leg, thigh, shoulder, or rib. Um, that's why you'll get rabbit rillette, uh, duck rillette, and pork rillette. Um, not so much other animals, um, although I don't know why. I don't know the reason why. Uh, we usually eat that with bread and cornichon or like little pickles as an appetizer or a snack. Um, they're not meant to be a meal by themselves, but I've treated it as a meal by myself because I am a small eater. Um, yes. So, pâtés. They are finely or coarsely ground blends of meat. So, there are two classes of pâté within this. So, mousse version, M-O-U-S-S-E, not M-O-O-S-E, mousse. <laughs> or a country style, which is more of the rustic uh, pressed meats, not necessarily ground to a fine grain. Um, so blend of meat with organ meat, herbs, and seasonings. Some pâtés contain milk, brandy, or um, egg, uh, or sometimes bread to stretch it out. Pâté is often one element of a striped layer terrine. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen a fancy version of that, like uh, pork pâté with layer of cheese and then like a vegetable like pâté on top, like it's tricolor. So you slice it and there's three colors. Uh, but it can also be a very simple chicken liver mousse. That's the one that I make the most. Uh, yeah, and I put instead of um, duck fat or pork fat, I use butter. Like a cultured butter to finish it. Which is fun. Mousse terrine, I would be upset to eat mousse terrine, Canadian mousse terrine. Well, let's look through this book. I have like tons and tons of tabs you see that of things that I want to make. We'll just go to some of these highlights. Oh, minestrone terrine. Look at that photo. Minestrone terrine. This is asparagus, zucchini, tomato, broad beans, vegetable stock, fennel. Spaghetti. There's spaghetti in there. Oh, so it's like a, a soup, basically, but in a terrine form that you can slice. How fun is that? That's really fun. Um, oh, there's a bunch of sauces in here uh, that go with the terrines because, you know, it's like a cake. You want to have some frosting, right? So they have um, curry cream, fried garlic, tomato, and onion coulis, chive and shallot cream. Yum, yum, yum. <laughs> sauces are the icing to the meat cake. Am I ruining things for you guys? I think it's hilarious. We got a salmon terrine with ginger. Oh, yummy, 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 yummy. Can you imagine having that for breakfast? I think it has whipped egg in it. Yep, it has four eggs. This would be a great breakfast. Like, oh, could you imagine having a salmon terrine sandwich, like a bagel sandwich? I would do that. Mm, I would do that. We got more sauces, lime cream, sauce grabiche. Grabiche is uh, like kind of like tartar sauce. It's got uh, mustard, egg, capers, chives, lemon juice, salt, and pepper. Rabbit rillettes. This is one that I've made before. Wait, I'm going to show you the actual. There we go. Rabbit rillettes. So that is shredded rabbit meat conserved in its own fat. Oh, duck fat. It has duck fat. Sorry. Didn't mean to mislead you. Uh, we have marbled rabbit and foie gras terrine, which is going to be outlawed in 2022 in New York City. Foie gras. Let's see. More foie gras. There's like different shapes too. Like you see that one? That was like a bowl. You don't have to have a loaf pan to make terrines. You can use a ramekin or a small bowl. Just need to layer stuff. Ooh, here's a pâté and croûte. This is a veal pâté and pastry. Look at that. Fancy. It's kind of like a beef wellington, but more appetizer instead of a main course. Ooh, 
Ooh, a bacon wrapped hair terrine. Bacon wrapped rabbit terrine. Duck and juniper terrine sounds really good. This one's in a jar. Like, you don't even have to unmold it. You could just keep it in a jar and just scoop it out whenever you want to have some. Okay, this is a more rustic one. Shoulder of lamb terrine. This would be classified as a country pate. Looks good. I'd put that in a, in a focaccia sandwich with mustard. Then we have like the more non-traditional, like non-meat terrines, like a camembert apple and multi-grain bread. So this is like a reverse sandwich. You see that the bread crumbs are on there and the cheese is the bread. It's pretty cool. And then we have fruit ones like citrus fruit, tart tatin. Have you ever had tart tatin? It's a dessert. It's like an apple, apple pie-ish dessert. Apples and calvados, strawberry and fresh mint terrine. These all look delicious. That's the tart tatin. Apple. Yum. So terrines can be a variety of things, but the essential bit of it is that it's a molded item that is served cold. Yes. Fun. Yes, you can totally make a salmon terrine. Totally. There are definitely recipes for salmon terrine. I like it. It's a new way to like think about appetizers or like your breakfast. And especially if it's too hot to turn on the oven, making a terrine on Sunday, you know, you'll have it for the week. <laughs> yeah. Tartetin isn't necessarily a terrine all the time, but the way that he serves it in this book is terrine-like. So, because it's pressed in a, in a loaf tin. Fun! All right, friends, it's time in the stream to brainstorm some dishes together. Let's throw out some ingredients in the chat, and uh, we'll try to mash them up. Maybe three three ingredients, and then we'll see how they can work together. The weirder, the better too, especially since we were looking at Asian market ingredients. Let's, let's try to mash up three ingredients that you suggest in the chat into new dishes and come up with some cool ideas for dinner. Okay, we got crab paste. Wow, okay, starting off strong. Oatmeal, oh my gosh, Fitz Murphy, how are you? Sweet corn, okay, let's do it. Crab paste. Oatmeal and sweet corn. How would you mash these up? Oh, oh, okay. Fourth thing, octopus. Damn. Okay, guys, we got this. Um, no, that's great. That's perfect. These four are great. Crab paste, oatmeal, sweet corn, and octopus. Uh, you can participate in the chat, too. Um, you can mash up two of the items, three of the items, or even all four. All the ideas are welcome. This exercise is for... All of us to just expand our minds and think about the possibilities of all of these ingredients and maybe thinking of them outside of how you've regularly eaten them, okay? So crab paste um, usually it comes in a jar. It's very savory. It's usually crab fat with a little bit of the crab meat. It's very pungent, so it's more of a condiment than a main dish. Um, oatmeal can be cooked regularly, you know, with liquid, or it can be dried and roasted like in a granola. It can be ground into a flour. Um, sweet corn can be eaten raw. It can be boiled. It can be roasted. It can be grilled. Um, octopus. Octopus is a strange one. It either needs a long time or or a short time. So if you have sushi grade octopus, it can be sliced thinly for raw application. But uh, the common practice that I've sort of been taught is to pressure cook octopus um, and then fry it from there. So friends, what kinds of ideas do you have here? So oatmeal already, I have like a savory oatmeal with like a swirl of crab paste in it with like just simply buttered sweet corn on top. That sounds so nice. That sounds so, so nice. We could do a sweet corn salsa with like barbecued octopus. 
Ooh, using stuff that you learned today. You'd like a crab and octopus terrine that's made into a patty with fish paste, deep fried, and then put on an arepa. Hey, that is nice. That is very well thought out. <laughs> that sounds great. Yeah. Um, you could do, we could do a crab paste compound butter and serve it on the corn. That's one easy way. We could do, oh, we could do some, some version of an elote if we make a savory oatmeal granola. Do crab paste butter on the corn and then roll it in the toasted oatmeal as like a crunchy. The octopus, let's see. I don't really have a lot of experience with octopus. I only know it as like sushi or like pressure cooked or yeah yeah what is your what is your favorite way to eat octopus I drawing blanks I'll eat it <laughs> yeah Mexican corn sounds so good right now right I have some corn in the fridge I'm gonna have for dinner Oh, this is really making me think. I like this. Crab paste, oatmeal, sweet corn, and octopus. Grilled octopus can be good. Yes, yes. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Baby octopus. We could get the baby, like, baby octopus, and you could deep fry those like calamari. You could bread them in, like, oat. We can make a coarse oat flour so they're really crunchy. And then make a crab paste, like, sriracha dipping sauce. Ooh. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Korean baby octopus that's pickled and put in toasted sesame oil. I've never had that. That's cool. Korean baby octopus that's pickled and put in a toasted sesame oil. Wow, that's really making me think. Pickled baby octopus. Pickled baby octopus. We could do a soup. We could do a crab paste base soup. And then... Uh, Oh, a corn soup. Crab and corn soup. Crab bisque. Like lobster bisque has corn in it. Why not crab bisque? Yeah. Um, let's see. You could do oatmeal cookies with sweet corn studded inside of it. Have you ever had a corn cookie? I love corn cookies. Um, Momofuku's milk bar has a corn cookie. It's like a sugar cookie with corn in it. It's very good. Ooh, corn ice cream on an oatmeal cookie sandwich. Yeah, crab cakes with corn in it. Yes, let's not forget crab cakes. We could do, how else would you eat octopus? I've always just had, you know, uh, octopus in oil, like a jarred octopus or like grilled sushi. Yeah. These are making me think. I really like these these uh, ingredients, friends. Great job. Great, great job. A lot of good ideas. Cool. Well, those are a lot. Of, I, I'm so inspired. I'm going to have some corn for dinner, so thank you for that. So friends, I think that's it for today. Thank you for participating and for being here and watching and talking to me in the chat. Um, next week, Martin's already suggested food preservation um, because his CSA is um, getting a little overwhelming. Uh, what kinds of things do you want to hear about next week? We're going to talk about food preservation in general, but happy to cover specific ingredients cooking techniques or even uh, take apart a famous recipe if you are afraid of it. I'm happy to break it down into easier to digest parts. Uh, I love reading recipes. I write a lot of recipes. Um, oh great, you learned about canning in 2018. I wrote an article um, a month ago, but it hasn't been published yet. I'm waiting for them to publish it, but it's going to come out on Yumly. Yeah, we can talk about pickling, too, within preservation. I'll write that down. Pickling. Anyone else? Any requests for next week so I can do my research ahead of time? <laughs> I said this on Twitter earlier, but I spend about um, six hours producing this show 
Oh, cookies. Let's talk about cookies. Hell yeah. Okay. Okay. Friends. Yeah, next week we'll talk about fruit preservation in general, pickling, and cookies. Um, thank you, everybody, for hanging out with me on Wednesdays and Sundays. It's so, so nice um, to sort of just interact with people because I'm, I'm by myself here in Brooklyn. So it's really, really, it means a lot that you are here and watching this with me and participating with me and hanging out with me. Um, I'm really, really, really grateful. Um, again, if you want to support me in the stream, uh, there are lots of links below the video to help support and spread the word. I'd love more people in the chat. I'd love to help people figure out cooking and answer more questions. So the more the merrier. Uh, I hope that you have a good rest of the week. I'm going to try to relax a little bit. I've been a little stressed out lately. Uh, so I might dip off of the internet for a bit. Oh, the first thing you learned to cook was cookies. That's really cool. I don't remember the first thing. Oh, the first thing I learned how to cook was roasted garlic. <laughs> oh, we'll talk about that another time. First things we learned how to cook. That's a great topic also. But um, have a great rest of the week, everybody. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate you. Uh, bye. <laughs> Bye, happy shopping, happy eating, okay?